So I'm going to, I, I, I wasn't sure actually what to talk to you about today. And so I prepared two talks. And I'm only going to give one, so that's good. Uh, and I thought it was probably more interesting and instructive in the context of this meeting to uh, tell you the story of my life, if that's okay. So, uh, yeah, the reason why I'm here is because my name is on this medal. This is uh, 200 grams of pure gold. <laughs> and I think the funniest thing is that, uh, and I, immediately I, I, I felt very unworthy. I didn't really feel that I deserved this because like Dr. Semenza, uh, as you will see, I was just lucky and I didn't realize that actually they give Nobel Prizes for lucky people. <laughs> because you have to be lucky to make a discovery. Because discoveries are inversely, the importance of a discovery is inversely proportional to its likelihood. The more unexpected the discovery, the greater the discovery is. And as you will see, I discovered something that at the time would have been said to be impossible. So impossible that nobody was even looking or expecting or anything like that. Uh, I should have kept on to this, hang on to this gold medal because the price of gold went up considerably. <laughs> <laughs> and when I gave it away, my wife said, how, how, you better find out how much is it worth. So they told me it was 25,000 Swedish crowns which at that time was about 1,500 pounds. So I could easily afford to give it away because they were, giving, they were transferring more than 200,000 pounds into my bank account. That's how much a one-third share of the prize was in 2001. But I discovered, I looked this up, uh, by 2008 or 2009 when the crash came, the price of gold went up. These would have now been worth something like 9,000 pounds. It would have been a fantastically good investment to melt it down. <laughs> but never mind. <laughs> we don't care about that. So it's very intimidating addressing a room full of doctors because I have a very high respect now for doctors. Originally, I thought it was simply a matter of eating plenty of vegetables and keeping clean water. But I now realize that uh, the doctors have saved my life at least twice. Once because I had um, septicemia through an infected toe, really stupid thing. And the second time because I was dying of um, uh, congestive heart failure, unbeknownst to me. And I went to the doctor and he said, you better go to the intensive heart place in the nearby hospital and they saved my life. So now I take pills and everything is fine. And but uh, I'm grateful to you guys. Thank you. <laughs> so the history, I, I grew up in Oxford. Uh, my father's office was in this tower here in the Bodleian Library. Here he is. He was a librarian and a medieval historian. And actually, um, it's sort of interesting. He um, studied the, trans the, the transmission of knowledge in the Middle Ages by looking for transcriptional errors. You remember in those days, the monks copied the manuscript by hand. And of course, occasionally they would make a mistake. But then the monk who copied the mistaken manuscript propagated the mistake. So you could trace who saw what when by tracing these mutations, so to speak, <laughs> down, the, <laughs> down the thing. So there was a, uh, that was, that's the only thing we had in common. He was very good at speaking Latin and Greek. I was very bad at, I spent a lot of time learning Latin and Greek. But what I really enjoyed as a child was uh, science, and I had a wonderful first teacher who was a young German. He actually had a PhD 
um, I'm not quite sure in what. He was sort of very interested in control circuitry and was very a pioneer in the radio-controlled toys. He could, he even made a, a radio-controlled helicopter in the, this would have been in the early 1950s, really quite, quite advanced, I think. And so he was very popular with, uh, with us boys, and uh, in my class, I must say, it was in those days only boys. I think there were five girls in the entire school of 400 or 500, something like that. And uh, Gert made it seem like uh, science was, you know, very good fun, a little bit mysterious, but once you understand things, everything suddenly became clear. And the important thing was to understand the underlying principles, not to learn lots of facts, but really understand what was going on. Because if you knew the principles, you could work everything out for yourself. And that was terribly good because my memory was not great even then. Then later on I had, uh, I liked to read scientific biographies and I think the very first one that I read and really made a strong impression on me was the story of Marie Curie, uh, who was a very determined young woman and uh, won two Nobel prizes and it's a very inspiring story and I, I recommend if anybody hadn't read it, it's well worth reading it. And then the next one was the story of penicillin and I read a biography of Alexander Fleming and only much later did I s discover that uh, Fleming who discovered this antibacterial thing, here is a resistant strain of bacteria, here is the, the mold that he discovered which is making some substance. Well he was a used, lousy chemist so he didn't know how to purify penicillin or how to identify penicillin. So he, he was just a microbiologist, a medical microbiologist, and very good at that. So actually it was um, really four people who came after. The boss was Flory here. And um, the hero, I think, actually, was the, the, these guys all won the Nobel Prize. Um, but uh, he was the real hero because it was Norman Heatley, who I met just before he died, um, who discovered how to extract penicillin from the medium, uh, how to purify the penicillin, and how to assay the penicillin. The other great hero is a very interesting story and well worth reading. I mean, it, it, it is amazing. I mean, penicillin really is the, the paradigm of a wonder drug. And it was recognized by, by uh, really, by these, these two people character here, Chain and um, Flory. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it was a very small number of people. We sort of have to do translational research now, but they, it, it, they weren't sort of doing translational research because they were told to do translational research. They were looking for things that killed bacteria and did not kill the patient. And again, I think that in the medical profession at the time, this was considered impossible, inconceivable. I mean, I think that's the interesting thing. Hardly anybody was looking for this. And uh, it was a very short span. It was from, you know, 1939 to about 1943 that penicillin was developed, commercialized, purified, the structure. I mean, you know, by a tiny number of, 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 of people. And I think the most interesting thing was that Chain did this uh, after Heatley had managed to purify about one gram of very impure penicillin, so dirty brown powder. And uh, Chain injected all of that into two normal mice. And uh, apparently Flory was absolutely furious. How could you waste all this precious stuff? But of course he was right because the two normal mice survived this injection of very dirty, impure penicillin. So then they knew it was going to work. So that control experiment um, was, was actually the key to find something that was deadly to bacteria and completely harmless to, uh, to animals. Of course, they didn't know it was harmless to humans. That came a little bit later, but it was a good clue. Anyway, again, a wonderful story.
uh, which I read about. And then I was lucky growing up in Oxford because there were lectures that you could go to given by members of the university. And the first one was about evolution, so I learned about evolution as a 15-year-old or something like that. And, um, and then there was one on ionizing radiation, and the third one was on, on biochemistry and all these pathways. I think the pathways were not as well developed then. And I looked at these pathways and I thought, gosh, this is interesting, and I was good at chemistry. I liked chemistry, but was much better at biology, actually. Uh, and I wondered how, these, how the control of these pathways worked, which was not known at all at the time. Allosteri had not yet been uh, invented. And so I went up to uh, Cambridge with the idea of studying biochemistry, which is, and it was uh, a very lucky, again, a very lucky choice for me because uh, we had uh, lecturers who came from um, the molecular biology lab and um, Jacques Monod came over to Cambridge to give two lectures in my second year in Cambridge. An incredibly wonderful lecture about the control of beta-galactosidase synthesis in, in bacteria. And I, I asked my tutor, he said, I said, you know, is this true? And it was clear that Asher hadn't actually read the papers, so he didn't know about it. And he said it was a bit early to say. It wasn't too early to say. It was clearly right. So, you know, sometimes the young are ahead of their teachers. And um, Anyway, but the, the trouble with Cambridge, of course, is that it has an incredible history of uh, in really important scientific discovery, particularly in the, in the business of atomic uh, physics. I mean, quite apart from Newton and gravitation, uh, Maxwell developed his analysis of electromagnetism there, the electron, the proton, the neutron was discovered there. The atom was first split there. In a, again, by a very small number of people in a very small uh, space. And uh, when you looked at this, you thought, oh my goodness, you know, I, these men are so big and I'm so small. And it was really kind of depressing in a, in a, in a way. I mean, you know, if you feel good, I suppose you might be inspired by this tradition, but if you most of us don't feel that good most of the time. Most of the time, things aren't going very well. We are struggling, and so it was a bit intimidating. And then, of course, these physicists were joined by a biologist, and uh, uh, Jim persuaded Francis to study DNA, and the result was that they worked out the structure of DNA. Interestingly, actually, the chemical structure of DNA was also worked out in Cambridge and was also a Nobel Prize, but hardly anybody ever talks about that. But Alex Todd, who was the man with Dan Brown who discovered this, the actual chemical structure of DNA, was a bit cross. He said, uh, you know, that Watson and Crick did not discover the structure of DNA. They merely determined the configuration of the two strands. So, um, you know, but... This is really the key, of course, to all biology. I mean, uh, and we're still trying to work out how it works. And uh, that's a pretty formidable task. So anyway, I, did, I passed my exams well enough, and I wanted to do research because we, in those days, we all wanted to do research. That was very much so our our aim. I don't know why we wanted to do research, but that was, you know, if you asked anybody, I think at that time, they would have said, Mrs. Thatcher changed all that, and she uh, changed people from wanting to do research to wanting to make money. But I think doing research is more fun and more interesting and more rewarding. But if you do research, of course, you have to re research something, and that's quite difficult to choose. So my supervisor, uh, told me to go to the library and find a problem. So I went to the library and found a problem. And my first problem didn't work at all. It was an interesting problem, but it, it was a failure. So uh, the, the, the problem I really worked on came by chance by attending a scientific meeting. And I heard these two talks, which really determined the rest of my life. And the first one was by 
this Caltech professor here, Henry Borsuk, who talked about sea urchin eggs and the fact that when sea urchin eggs are fertilized, they begin to make new proteins. And he also told about uh, the fact that um, if you remove the iron from cells that are making hemoglobin so they can no longer make heme, uh, they stop making the protein. There was some sort of coordination between the protein synthesis and the um, prosthetic group synthesis. And actually, Ingram, who was famous for his discovery of the chemical basis of sickle cell anemia, was studying that. And um, he gave a, a, a marvelous talk, which is the in immediate inspiration. Um, here's a picture of myoglobin with the heme sticking in the heme pocket. Here's hemoglobin, which has four chains, but basically it's four myoglobin stuck together. And um, what Ingram said was that the ribosomes get on the beginning of the messenger RNA and start making the protein. The protein folds up, and, and at the point where it makes the heme pocket and the heme could come in, uh, if there is no heme, the ribosomes stop and wait for the heme to come in. And he presented evidence that that was how the control worked. So I went back to the lab and told my friends about this very interesting story. And they, being cleverer than me and more skeptical, pointed out that actually his evidence did not support this hypothesis. If anything, it was the opposite way around. So then we realized that the way he'd done the experiment wasn't the best way possible, and uh, that we could do the experiments better. And when I say we, there were really two key people. Lou Reichardt was an American visiting for one year. He's a very distinguished neurobiologist and mountaineer. And he knew how to make these reticulocytes, which are immature red blood cells in rabbits. I mean, it's really easy to do. And Tony Hunter, who is now head of the Salk Institute, uh, joined the lab about a year later, and he and I basically co collaborated and, and, and investigated uh, this, this point. And what we discovered was that actually the ribosomes did not form cues. They were randomly distributed on the messenger RNA, whether or not iron was present in, in, in the medium. So the whole thing was, was ridiculous. Uh, and, um, but we discovered one or two other things as well, and also discovered how to... Uh, analyze ribosomes. And I show this because in those days it was said you had to run one of these things a thousand times in order to get a PhD. <laughs> and uh, so here are uh, ribosomes on messenger RNA. Here are single ribosomes not attached, or the majority not attached, to, and, and the two subunits, the 40S subunit and the 60S subunit, which join together on the messenger RNA to to, 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 to when, when, when they initiate and uh, re remember that. Th these were great fun to run, and we got rather good. I mean, I, this is one of the things I was really good at. Um, and these, these pieces of apparatus and the centrifuges in which they were very expensive in those days. I mean, you know, you were, and there was tremendous competition to use these things. So you had to book them well in advance. So then I went to another meeting about, uh, I suppose, halfway through my PhD, and I met this guy here, who it turned out was the head of medicine of the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. And he also was interested uh, in the question of how heme stimulated protein synthesis. And so I, I spent a little bit of time as a, as a graduate student and went back as a postdoc, by which time uh, somebody else had invented a wonderful cell-free system. Um, all you had to do was to wash the reticular sites with buffer and then simply add distilled water. And they burst open by osmosis. And the supernatant, after spinning, still contained the ribosomes, uh, but had lost everything else and synthesized globin at pretty much the same rate that they would have synthesized if you'd still stayed inside this. So you had to add one or two things in an ATP generating system. And it only worked if you added the heme. And if you left the heme out, it started off all right, but then curled over and died. And this control was reversible, because if you added back heme here, then it, it, it started up again. 
And this preparation could be frozen in liquid nitrogen in small aliquots so that you could do an experiment any day, any time of the day, any day of the week, any week of the year. So if you had a good idea, you just went to the liquid nitrogen, took out a tube and, and did the experiment. And if you were really working hard, you could do just about three experiments in one day. So the turnaround time was, was very rapid. But it wasn't easy to figure out what the hell was going on here. Very clear-cut problem. Nobody knew the answer. Um, and it became like an obsession to figure it out. And what also became clear, somebody else, a guy called Marco Rabinowitz at the NIH, discovered that the way it worked was that an inhibitor formed when there was no heme around. And the inhibitor acted at the start, the, the point of attachment of ribosomes to the messenger RNA. So when you run polysome gradients, the, all the polysomes disappeared in these, in these cases. So, but nothing was known about how initiation of protein synthesis has worked. So there's no way, really, of properly analyzing it. And so uh, I, I was kind of stuck. We kept on repeating the experiment, and it kept on giving the same result. But of course, that's all very well and good, but you don't get any further. So I then started trying doing secret problems after dinner when the technicians had gone home. And this is a little bit naughty, I suppose, but it was, it was good. And I, I wanted to map genes in poliovirus. So I went to Ellie Ehrenfeld, who worked on polio, and got some poliovirus RNA, and it didn't translate because, of course, it was the reticulocytes don't get polio. Uh, but the HeLa cells that she was growing the virus in did get polio. So I thought, well, if I get some HeLa cell cytoplasm and add it to the retic, then it should make the polio virus. So I did that and got a very big surprise, which was that this poliovirus infected cytoplasm inhibited protein synthesis exactly the same way that leaving out the heme did, although there was lots of heme there, and that, wasn't, that what clearly wasn't the problem. So we, we analyzed this and found out what it was that was the inhibitor. And it was very peculiar because it was very large, and it resisted digestion by every known enzyme that we tried at the time. It did not digest with RNAs. It did not digest with DNAs. It did not digest with protease. We thought we were maybe dealing with some complex carbohydrate. But we'd forgotten one thing, which was that double-stranded RNA cannot be digested with ribonuclease. That's the basis of a ribonuclease protection assay. Uh, and so uh, that, was the, that was the answer. It took us six weeks, I think, to figure, to figure that out. And then we discovered that actually tiny amounts of double-stranded RNA inhibited protein synthesis. One poliovirus replicative form could inhibit synthesis by 10 million ribosomes. So it had to be catalytic. There wasn't enough room for all those ribosomes on the double-stranded RNA. We had a big argument with a guy from Harvard about that. It's, 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 it's very interesting, you know. People just don't get the most simple thing sometimes, but I mean, the logic was impeccable. There was another very funny thing about that. So I, I wanted to prove this. I wanted to get some synthetic double-stranded RNA, so I ordered some from Sigma. It's called PolyIC. And I did a dose response, because that's how you, you do a titration. And I thought I'd got the tubes around the wrong way, because uh, it, it didn't inhibit. And then I discovered that uh, when you add a lot of double standard RNA, it doesn't inhibit. You have to only add a small amount of So that was peculiar. And I realized, of course, that I mean the explanation is very obvious. It means that there are two things must have to bind on the same piece of double-stranded RNA and talk to one another. And if you add a lot, then one molecule binds to this double-stranded RNA, the other one binds to that, and they don't talk to each other. So, so, and that turned out years and years later to be the right answer, too. So you can sort of know the right answer without knowing the details. Anyway, and then there was another one. I, this was also a collaboration with somebody else, Nahama Kosawa, we discovered that Tiny amounts of oxidized glutathione cause an inhibition of exactly the same, and always the, the symptoms were, were, were the same. So this was, I didn't know what to make of this, but it got more and more peculiar, more and more complicated. And um, I wouldn't say that my postdoc was terribly successful, so I went back to Cambridge where I had a, a few years or two years of a fellowship to run and joined uh, Richard Jackson 
who very much so fulfilled Jim Watson's advice, which you should always try to work with people who are cleverer than you are. Awfully good advice, that. Um, and we made a very good team, and it was a very happy time of I think, both our lives. And um, we very quickly discovered the key to the problem, which was these are, again, you can see why I showed you polysome gradients. These, the polysomes are actually all off to the right here. So here's a single ribosome peak. And they're labeled with S35 methionine, very cheap, easy label to use, not very dangerous. And you see this big peak over the 40S subunit. People had seen that before and ignored it. But when we discovered that it went away when you left the heme out, we paid great attention. And what we discovered was that this peak went away before protein synthesis stopped. So it was pretty clear that this was a precursor to that. And this was the inhibited step. And uh, luckily for us at that time, the initiation factor, which catalyzed the binding of initiator tRNA, which you remember is, is uh, methionine, a, a particular initiator, methionine tRNA, to the ribosomes had been uh, identified. But we still couldn't figure out what the hell was going on. And we got into a terrible mess with uh, an Israeli group discovered that cyclic AMP inhibited the inhibitor. So that was kind of peculiar, you know, and we looked at that. And then we found that all these three, I forget which one is which, yes, uh, so that's double-stranded RNA, oxidized glutathione, leaving out the hemin. So we discovered actually two aminopurine was the, was, was the, was the best at doing this. And you, you see that when you add it back, you know, sometimes you get immediate recovery and sometimes you get a delayed recovery. And we were, just had no idea what was going on. It just got more and more and more complicated. So at that point, we had an amazing stroke of luck, which was that the lab burned down. And all the results, all the previous data were burned up. So we lost everything. <laughs> Fortunately, and, and, and you might think this would be a total disaster, but actually it was the best thing that could possibly have happened. <laughs> Why was that? Because we had to move labs, and we moved labs uh, to a, a teaching hematology lab in the hospital well away from the parent department, so we didn't have the teaching load went down. Uh, and opposite the famous uh, MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology with its 20 or something molecular prize, m uh, Nobel Prize winners in it. And um, Max Perutz was incredibly kind to us. I'm not sure why he was so kind to us, but he was. And he said we could use his stores and we could eat in his canteen and uh, the canteen, of course, was full of these Nobel Prize winners, past and future. And uh, this was a fantastic education for me because, you know, we just chatted. Francis Crick would come and sit down at your table and explain about nucleosomes. I mean, it was, it was really great. Uh, and as a result of this, I think very quickly, we, we, we also, all these old confusing data have been thrown away and we thought more clearly about the problem. And it very quickly became clear, this is double-stranded RNA. Uh, we discovered, actually what we discovered was that you needed ATP for the inhibition. And up to that point, we'd been using an assay which itself required ATP. So you couldn't possibly have discovered that ATP was required for the inhibition because ATP was required for the assay. We changed the assay to one that only needed GTP. It was a ribosome binding assay. And that needed ATP to inhibit. So it was pretty obvious that we were dealing with a protein kinase. And you, this is P32 labeled. And you can see that this uh, beautiful gel was done by Paul Farrell. When you add double-stranded RNA, this, and because EIF2 had recently been isolated and purified by Theo Stalin in Basel, um, it was really easy. I mean, you know, everything just fell out. You phosphorylated this initiation factor and that somehow inactivated it. And this was a very early example, actually, of uh, protein kinases. Most people had focused on cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase uh, up, up to that point. And, and this, this, so this was, this was my first really big discovery. I mean, it's something I've been working on for 10 years, really obsessed by and bang, it has a nice, clean, simple answer. Very good. And here's an example of uh, a, a, an enzyme getting, actually in this case, turned on by phosphorylation. And uh, 
It's pretty interesting, actually. You look at these two structures, there's really very little change to my untutored eye, but this thing over here is totally dead, and this thing is totally, totally alive. Now, another interesting thing, I, I, I put this in because it's... A, so, we were very amazed when uh, the great Ochoa, Spanish Nobel Prize winning um, biologist, biochemist, uh, published a paper in the PNAS which said that actually the whole thing depended on cyclic AMP. Well, this didn't make much sense to me. And, uh, and so we, we decided to investigate it. So I discovered that there was a guy in England, or rather in Scotland, uh, called Phil Cohen, who worked on this thing. So uh, Paul and I went up to Phil's lab, and he had purified, highly active samples of the cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase. We added that in. It had absolutely no effect whatsoever. So Ochoa was clearly completely wrong when you use proper enzymes. So where had Ochoa got his enzyme from? He bought it from Sigma Chemical Company. Okay, Sigma Chemical Company supplied this enzyme packed in bovine serum albumin. So we tested, maybe bovine serum albumin can inhibit for some funny reason. Well, we tried bovine serum albumin, it didn't. But then we discovered that Sigma boiled their bovine serum albumin first. Uh, in order to completely inactivate any contaminating enzymes. So we boiled the bovine serum albumin, and sure enough, it inhibited protein synthesis just like double-stranded RNA or leaving out the hemin. And because of that, um, we actually, this is a, a, really a admission of failure. I mean, it was a, I was quite proud of this piece of detective work, but we missed the fact that what we were turning on was the unfolded protein response. Because it turns out that there are four of these proteins, four different enzymes, which inhibit protein synthesis, which are turned on by, they all detect different conditions. And this one that we missed was called um, the unfolded protein perk. The, and in fact, it turns out that according to Peter Walter, who I see from time to time, that PERC inhibitors are showing some promise in the treatment of neurodegenerative diseases because it turns out all those protein tangles inhibit protein synthesis in, in the nerve cells. And if you can stop them inhibiting the protein, it's the inhibition of protein synthesis that leads to apoptosis of those nerve cells. So if you can block that, it, it keeps, I don't know, I, it seems a bit unlikely to me. But I mean, I like the idea that 40 years later, Maybe I was on the brink of a cure for Alzheimer's disease, but missed it completely anyway. So um, the, the moral of this story is that I've solved the problems I've been working for all my life up to that point. So now what to work on? So I remembered Borsuk's talk about the sea urchin eggs. And we organized a, an EMBO workshop, and I invited Tom Humphreys, who was the only person in the world who was then left working on sea urchin egg protein synthesis. And as it just so happened, I didn't know this, but Tom was a very keen cyclist, and I lent him my bicycle to go for a bicycle ride in Cambridge. And so we became friends through this yellow bicycle. And he said when he came back from the cycle ride, or maybe two or three days later, why didn't, how would I like to come to teach in Woods Hole and uh, we could maybe do some experiments on sea urchin eggs together. And so I leapt at the chance. I knew about Woods Hole. I'd actually been there during my postdoc. And it's a very beautiful place. And it's a kind of summer camp for, 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 for biologists. And it's, where is it? It's sort of there. And you can see it's beautiful, surrounded by, by the sea. And here is a female shedding her eggs. You give her a 12-volt alternating current electric shock and she gives up her eggs, and you do the same to the male, and he gives up his sperm, and if you mix eggs and sperm together, indeed, this is my data, uh, unfertilized eggs hardly make any protein at all. Uh, when you fertilize them, there's a brief lag, and then protein synthesis takes off. So we wanted to find out how that shift, what, what turned on protein synthesis. And also learn to look down the microscope, and um, I didn't realize the significance of this at the time, but if I add some sperm to these eggs, 
you see is a speed. Uh, the first, they, they divide roughly every half hour, and they divide amazingly synchronously. And all you have to do is to make sure you mix the eggs and the sperm properly together, and they divide synchronously. Uh, and um, I didn't think very much about that <laughs> until uh, a couple of years later I heard a talk by John Gerhardt, very distinguished enzymologist, uh, who explained how progesterone worked on frog oocytes. Now, oocytes are the precursors to eggs. Females have oocytes, which, in the case of a human, become eggs once a month. In the case of frogs, become eggs in the spring. Uh, and let's add some progesterone to these oocytes. It's not very dramatic, but watch there. A white spot appears after about five hours or so. And actually, that requires um, new protein synthesis. Uh, if you were to able to see into the, f the oocytes, which you can't because the frog oocytes are extremely opaque for, because of the yolk, but these are starfish oocytes, this is a different hormone. This is 1-methyladenine that, that brings about this transition, but let's add some 1-methyladenine. It's amazing. The, the nuclear envelope dissolves. I mean, the total transformation we can't actually see inside, and then that little lip at the end, you can just about see somewhere yeah, there and there and there. This is the first polar body. A very, it's a very uneven cell, cell division. So that is triggered by this magic stuff called MPF, maturation promoting factor. This process of turning an oocyte into egg is called maturation, and it's brought about pro progesterone, but the great Yosho Masui uh, discovered that actually um, what progesterone is doing is activating an inactive precursor. And he showed that by sucking out some cytoplasm from a mature egg and injecting it into a fresh oocyte. And now you didn't need protein synthesis. There was some kind of autocatalytic activation uh, going on. And John Gerhardt described this in his attempts to purify MPF to find out what it was and how it worked. And the problem was that when you tried to purify, it just disappeared. It was very, very it appeared to be extremely unstable. And the best they could do was to show that it was always high just before the chromosomes came apart in meiotic or mitotic cells. And it wasn't long before people discovered that it was in starfish oocytes, which I've shown you. And indeed, in I think 1982, in human cells as well, and even in yeast. So this was a sort of universal factor, but nobody knew what it was or how it worked because you could not purify it. So uh, this is the point at which I made my Nobel Prize winning discovery. Things were not going well in the lab, and we did not understand how protein synthesis was turned on. And I read this book, Artificial Parthenogenesis and Fertilization. And that means virgin birth in sea urchin eggs. It turned out that you could make sea urchin eggs develop simply by adding things like dilute soap solutions or I think mild alkali, one or two funny things, which had been discovered almost 100 years before by this very distinguished uh, medical researcher at the Rockefeller Institute. And I was sort of looking for clues in reading about this. And wanted to compare the patterns of protein synthesis in artificially parthenogenetically activated eggs and properly fertilized eggs. And I did the experiment and got a shock of my life because I saw this impossible thing, which was that this protein here, which is actually the strongest protein synthesized early on, gets stronger and stronger and then disappeared. And then it came back again, and it was very easy and quick to find out that it kept on coming back and going away again every time the cells divided, that if you blocked them entering cell division, it, didn't, it was perfectly stable. So it was only unstable, it turned out, for about five minutes uh, just after the metaphase to anaphase uh, transition. Um, it's a little bit easier to see here. There are actually, when we looked at at clams, which we've been investigating for another reason. It turned out there were two of these proteins that showed this behavior. And this had never been seen before. And as I say, at the time, would have been considered um, utterly impossible. And uh, as luck would have it, uh, last year's speaker, Aaron Shikanova, um, had just 
joined uh, Harvey Lodish's lab at MIT. And in the summer of 82, I invited him to give a lecture about the ubiquitin system, which he did. And it was a wonderful lecture, really beautiful work. And um, it, it didn't occur to me that the disappearance might be due to ubiquitination, but actually it turned out much later that that indeed was the, was, was the answer. Now, uh, and I, re I realized that I'd sort of stumbled on something that surely had to do with the control of cell division. It looked very much, the comings and goings of this protein made it look like I, it must be somehow associated with the comings and goings of MPF. But I realized that I, you know, I, I, I was an expert on protein synthesis at the time, and I knew that the only way you really understand a subject is by making every stupid mistake you can possibly make, and then not making that mistake again. But in the case of the cell cycle, you know, I knew this was very complicated, and I knew nothing about it. I didn't know what was, not, what was known and what wasn't known. So you talk to people, read up, and... Uh, look and as, as you know I mean you know it, it's, a, it's a complicated unfolding process this I mean it doesn't, it doesn't look simple at all and um, you know it, it had been discovered a little while before that, the, that DNA synthesis alternated with, with mitosis and there were gaps in between and there were control points in, in this there was a control point here and a control point at the end of mitosis and a control point at the beginning of of S phase, but how that control was exercised was darkly mysterious. And indeed, people tended to emphasize the complexity of things. And this is a review by one of the great experts on mitosis. And really, the only good thing about it is this idea of the, the starting pistol in the, in, in the, in, in, in the middle. But seriously, um, progress had been made by studying yeast genetics. And it turned out that you could isolate mutations that controlled the cell cycle. And Hartwell and his colleagues focused on CDC28, which seemed to control a process they call START, where three different things were, were all controlled. And Paul Nurse, who read Hartwell's papers and was inspired by them, decided to work on a different kind of yeast and focused on CDC2 because it turned out that CDC2 could be mutated to either inactivity or hyperactivity, which suggested, again, it must be a control mutation. And it appeared that Hartwell's gene controlled this transition and Nurse's gene controlled that transition, an entry into to mitosis. So they looked like quite different, different things. And it came as a great shock to discover that actually they were the same thing and interchangeable. That was confusing. Um, and then, um, even more shocking, this yeast protein was found in humans. And, and that came as a great surprise at the time because people had actually criticized Walter Bodmer, my first boss in Cancer Research UK, because Walter had been criticized for hiring a yeast geneticist because yeast don't get cancer. But when it turned out that yeast control genes control the cell cycle in humans too, people realized that actually Walter had been a very wise and foresighted a hire of talented young people. Uh, but in none of this did cycling fit in, and it took a long time, and in particular these two graduate students here flanking Paul Nurse, uh, who cloned and sequenced first uh, John Search in cyclin B and then Jeremy uh, Frog cyclins A and B. And once we knew they were in frogs, we were, I was very pleased by that. And uh, the answer turned out to be that cyclin was the activator of CDC2, CDC28. And uh, it was another protein kinase. So we'd been very stupid not to, I mean, you know, we'd, this didn't emerge until about 1988, six years after the discovery of uh, cyclins and long after the discovery of CDC2 and CDC28 and their sequencing, which said it was a protein kinase, but it didn't have any activity because people didn't realize you had to add the, the cyclin. And then there's another, I mean, it is complicated, but the funny thing again is that um, we were completely brainwashed by the example of cyclic A dependent kinase, which had an inhibitory subunit. And we never 
thought about the obvious possibility, if you can have an inhibitory subunit, why can't you have an activating subunit? So this is just the, the exact converse of, of cyclic A kinase. I mean, you know, I, I'm amazed looking back on my life how often it's been that we were blinded by preconceived notions which were completely wrong. Uh, and those are very, very difficult to spot because they're sort of built into your whole Weltanschauung. You know, you, you can't, it's until, until the evidence uh, pushes you out. So, so <laughs> what had looked terribly complicated turned out to be terribly simple. Um, cyclin accumulates, turns on CDC2, and the cell enters mitosis. Cyclin destroyed, CDC2 turns off, and the cell exits mitosis. It's actually, of course, not as simple as that. And uh, much later on, I started studying the phosphatases that remove all and discovered the control of phosphatases as well as kind. But that's a whole other story which would take another hour to, to describe. And then it, it, it you know, it, 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 it fell out that the A and B control entry into M phase as a cyclin, the same principle is used to enter S phase. But of course, you don't want to uh, initiate mitosis here, that would be a disaster. So you have a kind of more feeble, a less active kinase that's responsible for that. And then indeed there's another one which uh, turns out to be a target for certain kinds of breast cancer treatment for reasons I don't understand, which seems to control the, the growth of cells rather than uh, cell cycle transitions. And now the alphabet of cyclins runs up to T, I think. So here you are, and uh, I, I, you know, we sort of understand in quite considerable detail what is going on. Yeah, I, I, this is an amazing movie which I got from somewhere. But I hope I've shown you that the important thing about research is to keep going on down the road. You never know where the path is going to lead, but the sensible thing is to follow the path wherever it leads and not just stick to the to the main road I, i'm a great believer in exploring the highways and the byways because it's these little clues which very often uh give you the answer and uh above all you have to sort of believe in yourself and just don't 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 be scared you know you can always figure things out just ask people or read so good luck everybody